Hey folks, welcome back to the Poor Pearls Almanac. I'm excited to share with you a wonderful conversation I had here with Doug Tallamy. Now, Dr. Doug Tallamy is an American entomologist, ecologist, and a conservationist. He's a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, and he's written and co-authored several books, many of which you've probably read or heard of, as well as many papers. The books you're probably familiar with are Bringing Nature Home, The Nature of Oaks, and Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard. Dr. Tallamy advocates for home gardens and landscaping that bridge the gaps between parks and preserves and providing habitat for native species. He has spoken on the connections between plants and insects and how those relations are important to birds. Talmy has overseen rigorous field studies that examine native versus introduced flora as caterpillar hosts and chickadee habitat. During a time when more pop figures in agriculture and homesteading advocate for accepting and even focusing on the silver linings from invasive-led novel ecosystems, Dr. Talmy remains a critical voice in both research and public-facing discussions around the importance of natives in our landscape. I believe we all have something to learn from Dr. Talamy's work, and I'm sure you'll enjoy this conversation. Doug, thanks so much for coming on. I think many people listening are aware of your work, but for those not familiar with your name, could you just give us a a brief background? Well, I'm Doug Talamy. I'm a professor at the University of Delaware and have been since 1981, so it's been a while. Um, (laughs) Seen a few things. (laughs) You know, my work. Yeah, my work recently is focuses on on really conservation issues, starting with plants, the insects that eat those plants and transfer the energy to the animals that need that energy so that we have functioning ecosystems. How do we keep all that intact? It's not an easy question, and you've written a number of books on the subject, uh, which are all fantastic, by the way. I I think I've read most, if not all of them at this point, and it's really refreshing, I think to see some of the things you're saying and kind of the research that you're finding. Now, I think as an advocate for native plants, there tends to be kind of like three major areas where people who are concerned with these things focus their energies. And those are kind of like industrial agriculture and the impacts that has, invasive species and the impacts that has, and then like the general like ecological change and destruction, whether that's, you know, clearing, you know, a a wetlands to put up a mall or, you know, um, suburbanization you know, all these different ways that ecological destruction takes place, right? But obviously, like, it's not as simple as just saying there's these three areas. They they overlap a lot, right? So let me ask, what's, like, we understand these things are bad. We still have to, like, put up houses and things like that, right? So, like, what, what are some of the things we can do, you know, for non-plant people to, um, I guess, like, be a little bit more ethical about this? Huge subject. Um, I'm going to go back to something you just said. We still have to build houses. You know, right there, we have what's unsustainable on this planet. We cannot continue to grow forever on a finite planet. So if we do that, there's that. There's nothing we can do. Native plants are not. The, you know, we're all going to go down the tubes because there are finite resources. If we outstrip them, we're all going to suffer. So assuming we get a handle on that, how do we share the planet How do we share other species on the planet with our own needs? And before we talk about that, let's talk about why we have to share those resources, because that, you know, those are the ecosystems that provide the life support to keep us around. So, yes, we can keep taking from nature. Uh, There's still more nature out there. We can take absolutely all of it, but that will do us in. So that there's a big, big misconception right there that that um, we're totally separate from nature. We don't need it. It's fun to visit, but it's just there for our entertainment. Not true. It's there to keep us alive on this planet. So how do we sustain it? And by the way, partially sustainable is not good enough because that's still unsustainable. Sustain- sustainability is an uncompromising word. You have to reach sustainability or it's unsustainable, and unsustainable is not an option. All right. We share our spaces by including as many of the things that make those ecosystems run in our landscapes, in our corporate uh, landscapes, our residential neighborhoods, our roadsides, even our agriculture, as many of those as as possible. So sure, there's going to be, uh, you know, those places are never going to be as rich as as a place that's that's untouched, but um, we can do a whole lot better than we're doing right now. 
I mean, that's kind of an intro. I don't know how, how long you want me to just <laughs> spout off here, but yeah, I mean, like I'll, I'll go to the idea of like industrial agriculture, like you and I, we, we don't really have a say in like how our food is grown, right? Like there, there's a limitation to what we can do in terms of, again, like unless you're rich, you can't really choose to buy local for all, for all of your food. Right. And even then it's not as simple as it sounds because if you buy local pasture raised poultry, for example, well, they're still getting fed chicken feed that is probably coming from some monocrop someplace. And then, like I said, you, you don't really have a say in like if builders are building a house. So I think that can be like overwhelming. And I, for an individual, and I guess to kind of gear the question a little bit, the only thing that I can do, because I can't control the houses being built, I can't control where food is being produced on mass scale that's affordable for me. I can control the invasive species to an extent in my neighborhood, right? Well, right. Uh, so so what you're doing is outlining global issues. And you're right. I, I can't ask somebody, hey, take care of all of this. That gets overwhelming and you just get <laughs> depressed. But I can say it's your responsibility to take care of the land that you, quote, own, the piece of the earth that we own. If we own that piece of the earth, we own the responsibility of taking care of it. And that means keeping the ecological integrity of that piece of property. That means, so there, there you, you just focus the problems. Are there invasive species on your property? If so, yeah, we have to get rid of them. What's the percentage of native plants on that property? I bet we can increase it. How much lawn do you have? I bet we can decrease it. Are, are your the lights you have on at night that you probably don't need at all? Can we put yellow bulbs in there instead of, of the white bulbs that attract and kill, kill insects? Do you hire Mosquito Joe to kill everything that's out there? All of these things are things that you can control yourself, one person. You don't need a team. You don't need an army. doesn't mean you do it overnight, but you can pick at it to improve the ecological integrity of your little piece of the earth. And if everybody did that, we'd be done. <laughs> so this focuses the problem into something that's manageable. It empowers you because now there's something you can do. It's not just talk. You can actually do it. And you get to see the results because when you do those things, life will come back to your property. Uh, and that's a lot of fun. It's very healthy. And you, you're, you're part of the solution. You get to see, hey, this is, this is happening. So if you... Let's say, all right, you really fixed your property. Then maybe you can branch off to a local park or or something else. But let's keep the objective small and doable so that you don't feel overwhelmed in the beginning because that's what we want to do. We want to get everybody on board. A grassroots solution to this global issue. Yeah. You come at it from a bunch of different angles depending on the book you you wrote. So like it, you talk about oaks in one particular book. Uh, the, I believe it's called The Nature of Oaks. And in it, you make like a lot of arguments about why oak trees belong on our landscape and we should be doing much more. And in it, you all, you know, while you do you know, profess the the value of oaks, you also talk about some other key species that I don't think we we recognize maybe as as native or like as um, prominent in our landscape, but have like a lot of value. So like black cherry, willows, things like that, that can do a whole lot for our, our local ecosystem. And I think for a lot of people, that can be a lot easier than like, you know, trying to put native pollinators or like flowers, annuals, short perennials, things like that, because it's you put the tree in the ground, you water it a couple of times so it doesn't die right away. And then like that, that's pretty much it. And, and that's really uh, in a world where people want instant gratification and they don't want to like be tied down for a long period of time. Like if that's the minimum everyone did, we'd, we'd be in a lot better shape. What I also think is interesting to kind of go on a little bit of a tangent is like the the value of oaks has been historically significant, right? Uh, whether it's indigenous people utilizing them for food um, or for game. And I think you still see this in the hunting community is that they're highly valued for game, but we, we don't have that relationship to them as much as we used to. So I want to ask, as somebody who does spend a lot of time talking about flowers, what drew you to oaks in particular and um, how do you see them kind of fitting into like an increasingly uncertain future? Well, what drew me to them was our research that, you know, what we've shown is that caterpillars are really important insects because they are transferring most of the energy that plants harness from the sun to other animals. Uh, and it's a really convenient index. If you know the number and, and, and diversity of caterpillars you have in a food web, you know how healthy it is, how productive it is, and how stable it is. So that led us to what plants are producing the most caterpillars. 
what we did was go through the literature for the last hundred years, really, um, looking at at host plant records. So this this caterpillar is recorded on this plant, on and on and on, over four thousand references, and we built this database for every county in the country that ranks the plants in terms of their ability to make caterpillars. So that's where oaks come out number one. They support over 950 species of caterpillars uh, nationwide. So in the mid-Atlantic states, 557 species. Um, and, and cherries are, are great and willows are great too, but more than 100 species fewer than, than oaks. And then you get down to most other plants and, and oaks and those keystone plants are orders of magnitude more productive than uh, many of our other our other plants and or trees and plants. So, so that's why I talk about the keystone plant issue. We've got to have them in our landscapes if we're going to have functional food webs. And you might say, well, I don't want all those caterpillars on my tree. The tree would be all eaten up. No, it won't because you've got birds eating those caterpillars all the time. Hundreds of caterpillars every single day when they're feeding their young. So it takes thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of one bird. And the real issue is we don't have enough caterpillars. It's not we've got too too many. And right away you can say, well, what about the gypsy moth? I'm not talking about non-native caterpillars. I'm not talking about invasive species because they're here without their natural enemies. The birds don't eat them and they do cause a whole lot of trouble. I'm talking about the native caterpillars that are that are um, co-evolved with our plants and the things that eat them as being vital to, to functional ecosystems. So oaks are not only the best in terms of making caterpillars, they're also the longest lived and very densely um, built. In other words, they're sequestering more carbon than, than almost any other plant. And they're holding it longer and they've got big root systems. So they're managing our watershed better than most plants. They're pumping more carbon into the soil better than most plants. Uh, they even help pollinators, even though they're wind pollinated, our early spring bees go to those catkins and get that pollen. They're not moving it and they're not pollinating, but they are using the pollen. So they're, they're functional in that regard too. Um, what's the sequester? carbon, manage the watershed, help the food web, and the pollen. Okay, so those are the four things that oaks do really well. And those are the four things that every landscape has to perform if we're going to reach a sustainable relationship with Mother Nature. So if you can pick one plant that does it all, that's why I focus on oaks. And one of the most amazing things about oaks is that it's also like one of the most ubiquitous plants across the landscape in at least North America. And um, I, it, the amount of diversity that exists is incredible. There's just, there's so many variations and they interbreed so well. And like, it, it's cool to see how wide the, you know, from a chestnut oak to, uh, you know, a burr oak to a, a burr oak that grew up in swamplands where they have these acorns that are like the size of a fist almost. Like, it's just, it's wild to see it all be in the same, you know, genetic pool, basically. Yeah, there are 91 species of oaks in, in North America, and that doesn't count all the hybrids that, that are viable, by the way. There are 200 species of oaks in Mexico. Mexico is really a hotspot for oaks. And 435 species uh, across the world. So oaks do, that genus does have the largest distribution of any tree genus in the world. Yeah, so it's, it shouldn't be surprising then that we have this like historical innate connection to them because it's if they're a keystone species and they are everywhere, like how how could we not? And I think part of the reason why we don't value them is because they're just everywhere, so we don't think anything of it, which is unfortunate because we they were so revered for so long. And uh, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how we how we rebuild, rekindle that relationship and that that awe that we deserve to have for the oak tree. Well, that's exactly why I wrote that book, was to try to get people to appreciate all the things that they do. The, the, uh, in, in terms of supporting biodiversity, there's a lot of things happening on the oak in your yard that people don't know about. And if you don't know about it, you don't go out and look for it. So I, I always say that knowledge generates interest and interest often leads to compassion. And that's what you're talking about, having more compassion for, for the natural world. You know, the thing that that attracted Europeans to oaks and to North America, really, was the wood, the value of the wood. They have so many uses. As a matter of fact, it's still an issue with white oaks in uh, Kentucky, for example. Uh, you have to make your, your bourbon barrels out of, of white oak, and it goes for wine as well. And they're over harvesting. They're, they're you know, they're, we got a lot of us eating, drinking a lot of bourbon, a lot of wine, and they're taking more oaks than, than are out there. So, 
Um, nothing, no resource is in, inexhaustible. It really isn't. We've, if we're going to use it as an agricultural product, and that's really what you're talking about, we're going to have to manage it that way and, and get a lot of more oaks back into the landscape. The big problem now, two big problems. Oaks really are fire climax species. They, they like small ground fires, and the Native Americans did that for uh, a long time and managed the landscape in a way that promoted oaks. But well, we Europeans came over and didn't like fire. So we said no more of that. And right away, that started to shift the dominance of oaks out of our forest. The second thing, though, is we've got an overabundance of deer, white-tailed deer, that not only eat oaks, but they eat all the native plants that come up and leave the non-natives, which creates, really exacerbates this invasive species problem because uh, it tips the competitive balance against our native plants. So you're not getting natural oak regeneration uh, because of the loss of fire and the overabundance of deer, which means you do that for a hundred years and you don't have any more oaks in the forest anymore. So, so um, this is why people say we're, we're gardening the world. And it's true. What we really mean is we're managing the world in a way that we can manage it in a productive way or, or uh, you know, an unproductive way, but Oaks are important. We need them in our forests, and we need to manage uh, in that regard. We want other plants too, but to manage in a way that eliminates the oaks is not going to be a good thing. You're talking about this a concept of regeneration, and I live in a, a like right on the edge of the Pine Barrens in New England. This area has been clear cut, and people have lived here for hundreds of years, thousands of years, uh, colonists for hundreds of years. And that clear cutting has decimated diversity. And if you go to conservation land here, it's all these white pines with, you know, they're they're 80 feet tall. And then the understory is white pines that are 30 feet tall. And there's a couple scraggler oaks here and there and a handful of cherries, if you're lucky. And that's about it. And it speaks to what exactly what you're talking about. We're seeing the repercussions of hundreds of years of evolution and because, or evolution is not the right word, hundreds of years of stewardship, uh, poor stewardship. And because our lifespan is so short, we don't understand what we're seeing is not normal. Right. And I think that's, you know, my, to go more on this tangent, uh, my neighbor happened to clear cut his property last yeah. week and it was mostly white pines and there was a couple of really beautiful white oaks and a couple of red oaks and i was like hey you know you should keep those white oaks they're really great trees if you get rid of the pines like they'll really fill out and be these beautiful trees and the tree guy came through and just cleared them out and was like hey do you want to buy this for firewood and i'm just like oh yeah. man like it's like I'll, I'll take it but like also like this is such a a waste of something that was a beautiful resource yeah. engaging those conversations without coming across as like a you know a tree hugging hippie is really difficult and even as somebody who does this all the time it it can be really difficult to get people to see the damage that has existed in what we're doing and how that relationship um, that was so fundamental to being human has been so severed we do not value the ecosystem services that various parts of those ecosystems provide um, actually, you know, I just heard yesterday that that uh, the Biden administration is, says, "Hey, we're going to start to we're going to put price tags on these things, and we're going to start to preserve the things that that protect our coastlines." You know, talking about big big aspects of ecosystem function, but it's a necessary thing. We 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 bite the hand that that feeds us by by eliminating uh, you know our support system, taking down oaks for firewood. We're, we're doing worse than that. We're taking down oak forests to put up solar panels. Now, solar panels are great, but I can think of a lot of places I could put them where you don't have to take down a, an oak forest that is a solar panel. You know, it's sequestered carbon. It's doing all the things that those panels are supposed to be doing, actually more than that. So, you know, we're, no. I don't know. <laughs> we're supposed to be a yeah. smart species, but sometimes I wonder, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think it speaks to that we're we're missing this very generalist knowledge that one you know this is going to sound I think it might upset some people but like we put kids in school and they learn all of these really great things but we act like as if before school before we you know we're sticking kids in classrooms or you know wherever that they weren't learning anything but they were they were going around with their their parents you know if we 
go further back to hunter gatherers, early agricultural societies, they were learning about their landscape for their entire childhood. So they knew what plants did and the value of them and watched them grow because they would see them all the time and then understood what these, how the ecosystem functioned, even if they didn't have the understanding of the taxonomy or anything like that. Not to say we need to go back to that, but you know, th there's a lot more nuance to it than like pre-education that we weren't learning anything. And uh, we need to bring some of that back, I think. Well, you know, we, we still learn outside of school, but what do we learn? We learn what's on our iPhone and we learn what's on TV and we learn what's in the, the video game. We're not outside in nature anymore, parents or kids. So there is no exchange of knowledge uh, of the natural world. That's that disconnect. 82% of us live in what we call cities, and you can define that in lots of different ways. But we, we've we lost the basic knowledge that you're talking about. No. And that's a very dangerous thing because, again, we've lost the basic knowledge about our life support systems. Got to fix that. Hey, we're taking a quick break in the episode to remind you that you can get a whole lot more information from poorproles.com. On our website, we have access to our supplemental reader for the podcast, which provides more depth and context, as well as thorough citations for all of the stuff we talk about in the show. You can also sign up for our newsletter, which updates you about limited releases, such as various nursery stock that we sometimes sell through the Poor Proles website, as well as updates about new merch that we have. You can also support the show through that website, poorproles.com, where you have access to our Patreon and our Substack to get early releases for articles and episodes. Now, if you enjoy the show and are just looking for even more audio content, go check out Tomorrow Today, which just wrapped up season one, or tune into the Gastropocene, which is a project of myself and Dr. Aisha Khan to discuss the way our diets have driven the Anthropocene and what it looks like to use our diets for good. Now, back to the show. One of the things when this episode comes out, we'll have already done it, but we're giving away native seed packets for wildflowers. And one of the plants in it is goldenrod. And a lot of people have been like, you put goldenrod in, it takes over everything. I'm like, well, yeah, that's a good thing because it's out It's one of the only native plants that can really outcompete a lot of natives. And if you were working in a, a very small, aggressive setting, you need goldenrod. It's an incredible plant that does so much, not just for out competing those invasives, but also just as a, you know, it, I think it's, if it doesn't have the most uh, pollinator support, it's pretty close to the top for an annual, right? Uh, it depends on where you live. First of all, it's a perennial because- I'm it, sorry. It, yes. It it's a, up over a, and yeah, over. a forb then we'll say, or grass. But in, yeah, most of the counties of the US, goldenrod is is right at the top in terms of supporting both caterpillars. So in the, in the where you live, they support about 110 species of caterpillars. But they also support more species of specialist bees than other plants. So asters are high and, and sunflowers are high as well. But um, goldenrods are really up there. And the reason that's important is that when we plant a pollinator garden, we want to support the specialist bees because the generalist bees use those plants as well. If you only plant for the generalists, you've lost your specialists. And we've got over a thousand species of specialists in this country. We can't afford to lose them. So a lot of people, you know, they put in uh, zinnias and, and uh, butterfly bush and, and other non-natives and they see pollinators come in. They say, oh, helping the pollinators. Well, most of what they see come in are, are honeybees, which are non-native too. And, and it's good. We want to help them. Uh, and, and a few bumblebees, but it's a, it's, it's a very small percentage of the bees that could be coming in there. And any one locality has hundreds of species of native bees that do are really, when you look at all the plants out there, they're doing most of the pollination. Um, so we've got to support them. And the best way is to put in the plants to support the specialists. And goldenrod is the best at doing that in most of the places, particularly certainly where you live, they are. Yeah. I've never seen someone get so much hate for talking about butterfly bush the way you have. <laughs> so could you could you explain that a little bit, kind of what's going on with the butterfly bush and its uh, misunderstandings? Yeah. Well, you know, its name is misleading. It suggests you're going to support butterflies. And it is a great nectar plant, makes lots of nectar and butterflies do go to it. And that's people enjoy that. But where do the butterflies come from? You got to make butterflies to have them to go to your, your butterfly bush. And that means you need butterfly host plants and butterfly bush does not support, it does, no larval butterfly can develop on, on butterfly bush. So you're not actually making any butterflies. The big issue in a growing number of places is that butterfly bushes has become an invasive species. 
I've got grandkids in Portland, Oregon. Um, you should see that butterfly bush is everywhere. It's a, you know, it's escaped and it's a serious invasive species out there in the West. It's taken over entire islands in Hawaii. It's a big invasive species in restorations near the Palmerton uh, zinc uh, smelter that was on the Pennsylvania, New Jersey border. Butterfly bush and Atlantis are the two big major problems. So here it's it's the same old thing. Now we know that it has invasive qualities, just like all the others uh, that that became invasive over the years. And yet we're still selling it like crazy. It's pretty, it's beautiful, you know, and it makes the butterflies come. So the average homeowner says, oh, that's great. Or I'll deadhead it. Okay. But I know how that goes. You do it a few times and you get tired of it. And, and <laughs> um, so those are the issues. It's got pluses, but it also has minuses that we need to, when we're looking at what a plant does, we need to look at the net value. All plants do something. Uh, and I could put some in the in the positive column, but you got to look at the negatives too. And if the negatives that way, the, the positives and the net value of that plant is a negative one. And that's, that's what people aren't doing. I always hear about, you know, oh, this one plant does this and therefore I should plant it. And it's true. It does that. But it does lots of other things that give you reasons not to plant it. And you've got to consider those as well. Yeah. And this, I think, segues really well into one of the areas I did want to talk to you about. And you you touch a bit on it in one of your books, uh, but I'll give you an opportunity to, I think, maybe explore it in a little bit more nuance, is around invasiveness. So one of the things that, uh, as an outsider, I'm not an ecologist, one of the impressions that I get from uh, these discussions about invasive species is it kind of feels like the climate change debate in the sense that like both sides argue for that there's scientific backing to what they're saying. But how like how true is that? Like what percentage of studies are actually backing that like invasives have a net positive, not just one species, but like as a whole for the ecology? Is it really just like a handful of people? Because whenever I try to find studies that like people cite, they seem to either be non peer reviewed, or they come from somebody that doesn't have any formal education in ecology. So I'm, I'm going to give you an opportunity to kind of talk about that. Okay, well, there, you know, there are trained ecologists who um, are who, who say that that they're not as bad as, as we think. The first thing they'll say is, yeah, you know, there are plants that are that are really problematic. We're not talking about those. Then they'll talk about the others and kind of blend it all together as if they're they're all the same. Um, they're all botanists. So they're looking at plants and not at what the plants are doing. They're not looking at the food web that is associated with those plants. So none of those studies are looking at the food web. There is a study out there that says, you know, do birds care if a berry is native or not? And the answer is no, they don't care. Well, actually, they, they do care. Further studies have shown that if you give birds a choice between native berries that are high in fat, and that's what birds need during migration when those berries are around, versus non-native berries that are high in sugar, and all of them are high in sugar, and none of them are high in fat, the birds will take the high, high fat berries all the time. They do choose. When you have an understory of bush honeysuckle or autumn olive or any of the others that take over everything, and you see the birds eating them, you say, well, they're eating those berries. They are. It's the only berry there, uh, and they're doing, the, <laughs> they're doing the best they can. Do they prefer it? No. Does it help them in their, their uh, energy balance for what they have to do? No. Uh, so, so that was a study that actually, you know, made a, made a statement and it's, it's incorrect, but I, you know, I can just talk about each one of them to say, well, <laughs> no, I, I love it. I mean, we've got 3,300 uh... species of, of non-native plants in this country, at least that are quote naturalized. You can say, say they're invasive 3,300. And they say, well, okay, you've increased the diversity of plants in the U S by 3,300 and diversity is a good thing. Well, diversity is a good thing, but you don't measure diversity on a continental scale. You measure it on a local scale. And when you go to a local place where a plant has taken over, go to a place where you've got porcelain berry, go to a place where you've got bush honeysuckle or barberry or all these other things that have taken over, plant diversity dives. You know, there are very few things there because these other plants, Phragmites, Kudzu, you know, they, there is not more plants there. There are fewer plants because... You ecosystems function locally. So that's where you have to measure whether or not you've got increased diversity. And in all cases, you have way less diversity when you've got an, a plant invasion. The public often confuses uh, what an invasive plant is, period. I hear them talk about uh, native plants, like things like uh, Virginia creeper as being invasive. 
what they mean is they're aggressive. We do have aggressive native plants and they, you know, they grow. That's what plants do. But the definition of an invasive plant is a non-native that's aggressively taking over, pushing out native plant species like, like calorie pear, um, like all the other things we've just, we've just talked about. They escape and, and then that's all you have. When those plants yeah. are not contributing to the local food web, and none of them do, by the way, in any substantial way, you have lost the food web value. That's the big missing link. I have been on debate panels with with these guys, um, and you know they they get real quiet when I talk about that. They never talk about what is the consequence of these these invasions, but there is a serious consequence. Look at the number of breeding birds, not birds eating berries when there's nothing else, but the number of breeding birds in an area where you've taken away all the bird food. They're not breeding there. They can't. Yeah. Like I said, I live right on the edge of the Pine Barrens in New England. And if you cross over, you know, if I drive you know, 30 miles down the road and I go into Pine Barren territory, the first thing you see is a wall of black locust, which is a native, native to North America, but not native to this area. And then if you make it past that, you might see a little bit of actual Pine Barren territory, and then you'll see autumn olive everywhere. And I still hear people talking about, I live in Sandy, uh, I live in a Sandy ecosystem, you know, autumn olive is great because it fixes nitrogen. And I'm like, well, that's, that's the problem is if it fixes nitrogen and those ecosystems evolved without it. There's this conflation that like healthy soil is like nitrogen, like is very similar to what we might think of as like garden soil. And it's not that simple, right? Yeah. Uh, North American soils, particularly in the north where the glaciers came down, are historically poor. They're nutrient poor, and our plants have adapted to that. You can kill North American plants by over-fertilizing them. And I've done it because, because I was totally ignorant <laughs> in the beginning, too. You fertilize them, they grow so fast that their bark splits, and, and then they die. So poor soils. You look at prairie plantings. They're adapted to nutrient poor soils. And when you when you fertilize, what you get is a whole bunch of, of weeds that need high nitrogen fertilizer or high nitrogen soils, and they outcompete the, the native plants. So too much nitrogen is not a good thing. But th- the point is, okay, they fertilize themselves. Autumn olive fertilizes themselves and it grows there. Why is that a good thing? Be- just because it's green and it's there? It's not passing on the energy that it's that it's harvesting. It is occupying a space that used to be occupied by a young oak or by something else. And the reason that autumn olive is there instead of the oak is that the deer has eaten the oak and left the autumn olive. They won't touch it. So that's that competitive balance I was talking about. They won't touch that. They won't touch uh, uh, the yeah. bush honeysuckle. They won't touch barberry. They won't touch burning bush. These things that have taken over buckthorn, New England, are promoted by too many deer and they're not providing that energy to the food web. So that's one of the reasons we got 3 billion fewer breeding birds in North America than we had just 50 years ago. The explosion of these, these uh, invasive plants, all of which, by the way, have come from the horticultural trade. We brought them over because we thought they were pretty. And uh, all right, I'll just quit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, we're talking about ecology and like this idea of Uh, And this is like the underpinning of like permaculture is like complex system science and like it's very valid. But I find myself the more I have these conversations about native plants, I find myself aligning more with like hunters, which you would think is like an unlikely pairing than like a lot of people in more of that permaculture circles, because as a hunter, you're actually seeing the impacts of invasive species on deer and, you know, deer populations. And I know you guys are in the same boat as us where we're, I have a friend towards your way. And I believe they said that the population right now is like 50 per mile or something crazy like that. Whereas the, the carrying capacity for most areas is like 10 to 15. So like the entire Northeast is just getting absolutely destroyed by deer right now. And uh, hunter, hunters are the ones that see that. Yeah, that would be that would be a good number in, in my house. We've got about 100 and 110 per square mile. There were nine deer in my front yard this morning. Jesus. You know, hunters are now the they're the only predators. Hunters and cars are the only predators we have for deer at this point. The only the only hope of keeping deer populations in check, and it's not enough, not, because hunters cannot hunt where there are a lot of deer, which is suburbia. <laughs> As a matter of fact, hunters in Pennsylvania <laughs> complain there aren't enough deer 
in the wild spaces. All the deer say, ah, it's, <laughs> we're going to the suburbs, suburbs where, where nobody can hunt us. Yeah, it's a weird selective pressure that's basically happened where the smart deer have figured out not to go into the woods. Yeah, pretty much. So I do want to talk quickly about your work with Homegrown National Park. Uh, it's a really great project. I think a lot of folks should be familiar with what you're doing with it because um, it speaks to, I think, the core of what we're talking about with the responsibility to steward the land where we live. Yeah, we started out talking about this. How do we how do we fix this? It, it, we do have these global issues, but there's 8 billion of us. And if all of us recognize the responsibility we have to good earth stewardship, and I argue that all of us need to recognize that because we all need good earth stewardship. You know, everybody depends on healthy ecosystems, whether they know it or not. And unfortunately, most people don't know it. But that means everybody's re got the responsibility of, of taking care of them. Right now, we have a very weird situation where we have a few ecologists and a few conservation biologists. Everybody else has a green light to destroy the planet. That's not working. And we can turn that around by just explaining, no, you got to take care of that piece of the earth that you own. So that's the grassroots part of Homegrown National Park that we, we talk about. There are 135 million acres of residential neighborhoods out there, and 44 million of those acres are lawn at this point, which is the low-hanging fruit. Um, lawn doesn't, you know, it's not doing anything for us ecologically. So we talk about reducing the area of lawn, putting the para, para, uh, powerful natives into those areas, and rebuilding ecosystem function right where we live. And recording what you're doing by registering your property on what we call the map. It's a map of the U.S. And you, you say, okay, I live here. I'm going to reduce my lawn area by this much. Or I'm going to plant this oak tree and, and, and take up you know, this many square feet of, of lawn with this important plant. You, re, you put that on the database and your little piece of your county will light up with a little firefly. Uh, and you get to see everybody else who's who's doing this around you. So it becomes a social network. The object is to get the whole country to light up as this idea that everybody is responsible for good or stewardship goes viral. That's what we want. We want it to do. Yeah. And it's, it's free. That's the important thing. Um, we're not competing with any other conservation organization. So we're not trying to draw membership away from Audubon or from National Wildlife Federation or Sierra Club or anything else. You still remember those things, but you're doing lots of very valuable conservation on your property and it's not being recorded. We're talking about Biden's 3030 uh, initiative. We're going to save 30% of the US by 2030. We could do it, but you're never going to record it and understand that we've actually done it unless you're recording successful conservation on private property. Because 78% of the whole country is privately owned. 85% of the country east of the Mississippi is privately owned. So if we do that conservation on private property, we will make big headroads towards actually getting, getting some ecosystem function into our human-dominated landscapes. The idea that humans and nature cannot coexist, is that's gone. That's out of there. We've got to coexist. It's our only option left. And Homegrown National Park is... is um, our small nonprofit to help push that along. That's what it boils down to. It's really uh, optimistic and uh, gives me a lot of hope that people can put aside our differences and recognize this like very simple value in understanding that we've been living on borrowed time in the way we've been living. And we've lived off of the, to use a metaphor, we've been living off the fat of the past uh, and, and that we're getting pretty close to the bone now. So we got to make some changes. So I, I really value, value the work you're doing with that. Now, one thing I think a lot of people, a good enough people, amount of people think about when we're talking about like creating rewilded spaces is homeowners associations. Now, HOAs are a, a battle. I li we live in the Northeast, so it's not as common, but I have lived in the South where it is much more common. But some changes have happened in the last few years around HOAs, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a big one in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago. The title was uh, We Fought the Lawn and, and the Lawn Lost. There was this Maryland couple that uh, their HOA said, you are, are not allowed to landscape with native plants. You must put in lawn. And they they challenged it. They you know they brought it to court. They ended up paying $60,000 to do it, but they won. They, they, they established a legal precedent that the HOA does not have the right to tell them how they can, they can landscape. So that that is going to, I mean, HOAs are, are changing on their own anyway. I've been telling people for years, 
join your HOA, educate them, get them to recognize that these rules we made in the 70 to make high status neighborhoods, that's fine. We can have high status neighborhoods, no more rusty cars in the front yard. But to promote ecologically destructive landscaping to do that is not, it's not the solution. You can have pretty landscapes that are ecologically sound at the same time. That's why I don't say get rid of lawn. I say reduce the area of lawn. Lawn is a, is a cue for care. The lawn you keep should be manicured, keep it mowed, have that strip along the sidewalk, the dry, sidewalk or your, your driveway, outline your beds with lawn. Lawn should be the place where you walk because it's the best plant to walk on without killing it. And you can do that. Nobody will even notice that you have more plants in your yard than you used to, as long as you keep that lawn happy. And even if it's a smaller amount, it's okay. So it's it's not that we have to you know destroy aesthetic landscaping. It's just that we have to choose the right plants and use more of them. And HOAs are saying, oh, okay, we get that. Uh, so I'm people are emailing me, say this works. I joined my OHA, my HOA, and, and it works. So that's what I encourage people. You don't have to take them to court. Just educate them. Yeah, take over the HOA. Find a few like-minded people in your community, and uh, you know. The, the reality is that if it's one of those things that most people don't bother getting involved with. So if sure. you do, um, and this this goes across like all small politics, and generally speaking, it's more accessible to people that don't have to work 40 plus hours a week, which means it's disproportionately geared towards people that have a certain value in keeping things the way they are. Yeah. And um, <laughs> that, you know, they, they want it to be how it's always been. And there's no reason for them to want to change. Right. You know, I know in my own town, like the conservation committee's got two open seats, like because it's just it's it people don't value local politics, and in many ways, an HOA is basically hyper local politics, yeah. right? It's yeah. it's at a granular scale of politics. Mm -hmm. um, ask anyone who's had to fight with them, like it it is very political, and um, I I think we need to be afraid stop being afraid of engaging with those politics. I think you hit the nail on the head. It's it's time investment. Yeah. Our lives are so hectic and frantic these days. Nobody has the time, but you're right. We got to make the time, make it, make it up it in priority. Yeah. So Doug, for folks that either want to grab your book or want to follow along with what's going on with uh, homegrown national park, where can they find uh, any of that stuff? Social media, websites. Homegrownnationalpark.org is the website. And really, it's all there. It's all explained there. Then the books are on on Amazon. So it'd be Bringing Nature Home, Nature's Best Hope, and The Nature of Oaks. Uh, and I co-wrote The Living Landscape with, with Rick Dark. They're all on there. If you don't want to use Amazon, and I get that, get your local bookstore to carry them yeah. uh, because that works too. Yeah. And I, I believe Homegrown National Parks on Instagram as well. Uh, we'll include all those links in the show notes. Right. Yeah. But um. I, I thank you so much for the work you're doing, the work you have done, and just keeping at it. Um, you're you're prolific in reaching out to the public in any way possible. So I think, I think in, speaking of being involved locally, I, I definitely appreciate you doing doing the legwork to get people to have these conversations. Well, thanks for the opportunity to to join your podcast. I mean, this is this is one of the ways I do it. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much. All right, take care.